and I am a medical historian at the University of Nottingham. And I'm here today to introduce our project, which is called Florence Nightingale Comes Home for 2020. And this is a project funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council, which started in 2018 and is due to run until August 2021. What we'd like to do today is to tell you a little bit about this project because it's particularly pertinent and linked to Derbyshire, really, because people don't tend to know that Nightingale had very strong, clear links to the region. And then maybe introduce a few of the themes of our book, which is coming out this autumn, and hopefully stimulate you to want to read it and um, buy it even. Okay, I'll just take, send you over to meet the team now. We have Jonathan Memmel. Hello, so my name's uh, Dr. Jonathan Memmel. So uh, I was a member of the, the Nightingale Project. I'm now a, a lecturer in English literature at Bishop Gross Test University in Lincoln. And Richard. Yeah, hi, I'm uh, Richard Bates. I'm a historian also at the University of Nottingham, uh, working with uh, Anna and Paul Crawford, who can't be with us today. Uh, as part of the, of the project team since 2018 and we're all co-authors on the book so it's a, a, a book co-authored by four of us which was a challenge in itself I guess but uh, I think we came through it. <laughs> <laughs> if I just say start off with a little bit how the project came about as with most academic research it was really the the result of a fortuitous meeting as I say, I'm, I work in medical history and at the University of Nottingham, we had a, a research area which was called Health Humanities. Now, um, really, Health Humanities is about the way that um, health related research can impact the arts. And really, basically, you can see an interdisciplinary interface between these two, um, maybe not necessarily. Um, aligned disciplines and there was a that the professor the first ever professor of health humanities working at the University of Nottingham um, Paul Crawford and he came to me and asked me if I'd like to participate in resurrecting really the history of Florence Nightingale. Paul's always um, keen on um, finding a good niche and a good story and he highlighted me to the fact that 2020 was to be the bicentenary of her birth and that there would be many celebrations across the country in terms of celebrating that and really looking at the legacy that Nightingale had brought to modern nursing and health and social reform more generally. So this was when we started digging about the sort of forgotten history of Florence Nightingale in the region. And Richard, are you able to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. So um, as Anna says, the, the, the connection to Derbyshire is really where that we began with this project, I think, and where the, the book Florence Nightingale at Home um, originated from. We, as we'll talk about, we kind of expanded the idea of home beyond Derbyshire as we went along. Um, but um, yeah, so Nightingale grew up uh, in Derbyshire for the first few years of her life. She was born in, in Florence, which is why she's called Florence, um, but the family then moved to Derbyshire and the family money um, came from Derbyshire as well. So Nightingale's ancestor, uh, Peter Nightingale, was a, a lead merchant in the 18th century and built up a, an estate and a fortune from the lead mining industry around Worksworth um, and then bought an estate in, in Lee and Holloway uh, and so Nightingale's father uh, then uh, built this house called Lee Hurst, which is still there. Um, and, um, and so she lived there for a few years. The family then moved to Hampshire, um, but they always came back to Derbyshire for three months of the year. Um, so it was a place she had quite a lot of connection to. Um, and in particular, I guess, um, her, her ancestor, Peter Nightingale, her, her great, great uncle, um, had a cotton mill. Uh, in Lee, uh, which is also still there, called John Smedley's uh, Limited, and um, and so Nightingale grew up with this connection to industrial Britain, and to um, importantly to the the houses of, of the workers there. She was familiar with the workforce there, and I don't know. Actually, did John, Jonathan, do you want to talk a bit about that now? Maybe about the the, the relationship that Nightingale had to that um, local population and how that kind of developed some of her ideas. Yeah, so I think. I think that was one of the really important um, early influences on 
on Nightingale as a as a young woman, um, obviously grew up in this such a place of of privilege in 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 these really kind of luxurious homes and houses. Um, but there was there's quite a specific context in Derbyshire, which was her her family's estate in Derbyshire was was surrounded by these uh, industrial this kind of industrial workforce and the kind of workforce living fairly close to her estate. So as a as a teenager, she was introduced to um, what was a, a fairly common practice amongst the kind of aristocracy, which was um, particularly the kind of the women of the aristocracy would go um, and visit visit the poor in their own homes. Um, so, I mean, it, it wasn't a particularly kind of reliable, um, kind of consistent way of um, showing support. It was a bit random. They would kind of pop up at various times of the year to um, to kind of stick their head round the door and check everything was okay. Um, but what what it did, I think we 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 think, is it kind of introduced Nightingale to a, a kind of a real awareness of um, the range of living conditions um, and really gave her a kind of an early insight about um, really the kind of the effect of um, different kinds of homes, um, the effect that that was having on um, on different people. So um, that that kind of idea takes a while, but but later on in in her career, we really see that. Um, that kind of concern with um, with kind of the housing conditions, particularly of the poor, um, really becomes really central to her um, to her work and a lot of her writing. Really, I think that's true, um, and I think that really is quite illustrative of, of the journey that led us to the book that we've just co-authored, because home, of course, is the physical space in which we all find ourselves, and really, obviously, the privileged homes that Nightingale grew up grew up in and also the poor homes she visited really influenced her idea of what home was or what a home should be and um, the way she framed her health research um, her health work more like but also um, I think what we found as we were going through the book was that home had other sort of metaphorical meanings to Nightingale because in one way home to her was a prison wasn't it it was something that she didn't like in terms of the white privileged existence she lived at Embley and Lee Hurst yeah and I think well I think I think you're right that as we went through that that and um, the things that Jonathan talked about about the importance of home we realized that home was a big deal in the 19th century as a concept and I think and maybe Jonathan can talk about that a bit more later um, but um, Nightingale when she's growing up is um, struggling against um, a set conception amongst the aristocracy and the upper classes of what home life should be like, especially for a woman. Um, and so she's expected to get married, she's expected to run a household, and um, she is not expected to uh, become especially well educated or to have, have a career. And that's something that she then pushes back against. And so there's a, a sort of decade of her life where Nightingale doesn't feel at home at home anymore. And she becomes very interested in what she can do work wise and feeling that she would only feel at home when she had real work to do. Um, so she tries to uh, train herself. She tries to go to Salisbury Hospital, first of all, to train. But her parents won't let her. Then later on, she is able to travel around Europe and the Mediterranean and visit hospitals and healthcare institutions there. And in, in particular, she spends uh, a first a couple of weeks and then in 1851, a few months, it's at a Deaconess's institution in Germany called Kaiserswerth. And that is a, a sort of training institution for Protestant women in healthcare and social work and Nightingale goes there in 1850 and immediately says that I feel at home here this is a home to me uh, in a way that her family's houses no longer were so we can see the Nightingale is starting to think about home in a different way it's home is what you're doing uh, as well as where you are um, and so we began I think from there to really broaden out what we were looking at in terms of home and what home meant to to Britain in the 19th century I think I mean, John Jonathan you sort of look at like English yeah. literature and, and and so on didn't you about that yeah I suppose I think quite early on we got this sense that um, Nightingale is this one-off um, individual and you know there, there there was some really 
a really important story to tell in terms of her her own personal life and the way that home changed but then i think we we quite early on realized that um a lot a lot of that shift was was also shared by a kind of the wider culture at, at the time and i think at, at the center of it was this kind of irony that we picked up on quite early which is um that as as things were kind of changing quite dramatically in all kinds of ways in the victorian period the early victorian period um and we we can think of that kind of idea of change or disruption in all kinds of ways whether it's about the kind of um a real kind of central time for the, the british empire and um you know the kind of expansion of the of the empire um or the kind of urbanization where kind of vast amounts of the population were becoming dislocated and moving away from places that their families had lived for, for generations um just at that time when things were becoming a lot more dislocated there's a lot more kind of mobility and change and movement we get this kind of irony which is this this kind of idealization of of stable comfortable homes so there, there's a really interesting irony which we saw reflected in nightingale's life but also um if certainly if you look into kind of the kind of writing and the 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 the, 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 the particular stuff i was interested in was fiction of the time think about writers like uh, Charles Dickens or Bronte or George Eliot a little bit later um they they they're all kind of drawing on this um this kind of fascination with home as a kind of a comfortable a stable place but at, at the same time they 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 they're kind of um looking at how how that kind of becomes such an important ideal at a time where there's so much disruption and change and certainly nightingale for nightingale i think as soon as she starts to move as soon as she actually leaves her physical home she starts to move she goes abroad you know she has an extraordinary um access to travel um to to kind of the far corners of europe um just at that time um it seems that kind of home becomes a a, a kind of a, an important kind of anchoring point um for her which which we found kind of at work in in a wider sense as well so um i think in 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 the book where i probably say throughout the book we're always um interested in looking at that um relationship so if you if you if you read this book you 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 learn about nightingale and this um this kind of tumultuous life that she lived um but you also kind of come to understand how that was operating within a kind of a, a wider society so you you learn something um about kind of victorian culture and society and all the changes that it underwent i think as well i mean um i suppose some some of what i've just been saying that about kind of change and expansion i suppose relates to some of your um a- area of focus anna in terms of the empire and um the kind of the global and i know for the book you 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 focused on some um some really kind of fascinating areas which aren't really that well known about how nightingale kind of engaged with that um that kind of global context which we're we're not really um i'm not sure that many people are aware of exactly thank you yeah i agree um nightingale is of course famous of, of being the lady with the lank ministering to the the poor soldiers in the crimea and as this idealized figure of compassionate caring but of course what is so interesting um certainly from our points of view is um how for most of her life actually she was an invalid and not only was she an invalid confined to her home which is something that she had never anticipated when she fought for freedom to to go and follow her vocation but during that time when she was at home she was actually became more expansive in her interests so after the crimea she came back to london albeit to mayfair and albeit supported by her father so again her privilege is allowing her to operate in a certain way and she she comes back from the crimea she's a national celebrity and what we find then is her her purview actually expands even though she's confined to her bedroom even though she's working from home suddenly her interests become really quite international she becomes interested in nurse tra- training schemes for canada and new zealand she becomes interested in um campaigns to um save aboriginal people in australia and most importantly she becomes interested in india and public health a uh, public um health 
in the Indian context. And this dominates really the, you know, her life from 1856 onwards. It's incredible that people don't really talk about her India work and when it, it, she did so much. And what's so interesting about Nightingale is even though she's establishment and even though she's liberal um, and she, she, so, so even though she's establishment, she's liberal, but equally she's, so she, and she holds that throughout her life and her attitudes of being both conservative with a small C and radical at the same time. And you really see that in her attitude to empire. She never really questions fundamentally the, the right really to give public health advice to Indian people, never really questions the, the innate um, superiority of Western knowledge, yet at the same time is really quite progressive in the way she thinks that health advice in the Indian context should be delivered by local people, or the way actually she supported Indian independence. So it's quite interesting really, isn't it, how she, she was at home, and yet during this period um, where she was confined, she was actually being very, very expansive and progressive. I think it's interesting that we had a chapter called Working From Home that we conceived of before well, everything kicked off and it, yeah. it's so interesting how the themes have now sort of emerged of people trying to work from home, work out how they can be productive from home. I should say though that Nightingale had a lot of servants and people bringing her food and things so she didn't, she didn't have any children, she didn't have the challenges that some people have got now. But just to come back to think what Jonathan was saying about the idealisation of home because I think that was important, we haven't talked much about nursing yet. No. But that was quite important in how Nightingale approached nursing as well and, and approached hospitals and um, institutions of healthcare because the 19th century kind of idealised domesticity. There was quite pressure to bring in elements of domesticity into institutions. And so Nightingale's first job really was running a, a care home in London in, in Harley Street. And the first for the first three months that she's there, most of what she was doing was... Um, that sort of tarting up the environment of it, right? So she was she was having her staff uh, sew new curtains and tablecloths and napkins and things, and was sorting out the food supply. And, and, and she went to Fortnum and Masons to get better quality food and that sort of thing. Um, but then there were sort of challenges with that as well because running a care home, she then realised that the problem was if you make if you make things too homely, then people don't want to leave and go back to their own homes. <laughs> Start accusing patients of being hysterical and, and they need to kick them out. So these, these ideas of home that are there in the wider culture, they influence what Nightingale is doing in hospitals as well. And then when she starts sets up the nurse training school at St Thomas's Hospital, similarly she starts thinking about nursing accommodation um, and, and creates a, a home for the nurse trainees um, with a home sister to kind of provide pastoral care and support and Bible classes, that sort of thing. And so these, these considerations of homeliness are all are really quite central to lots of aspects of Nightingale's work and to uh, and, and to thinking about nursing um, as well as just being to do with all of her domestic arrangements and but it was also fun looking at the domestic the fact that, the fact that she had cats and um, and, and anyway, we, we know sort of some of the things that she had for dinner and that, that sort of thing is, is nice but I think what was interesting for me was taking that and then really applying it to, to realising that these considerations of home, they, they sort of go into so many areas. I mean, you, Jonathan, you also related it to the war, right? the Crimean War and the idea of home really being important to what she did in the Crimea. And what yeah, was... yeah. So I think, um, you know, the, 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 the Crimean War was something that we always were, you know, we always knew that we were going to write about in the book. So I think, um, you know, you know, few people think of Nightingale without thinking of, the war, you know, as Anna mentioned, she's the the lady with the lamp, and um, you know, I think that kind of Im image of her um, kind of tending to the soldiers is um, is, is is definitely the, the best well known. Um, but yeah, after after kind of looking into it, and particularly looking at the kind of the early months of, you know, why why does Nightingale end up going out to the kind of other side of of, of Europe to go and help? Um, we found that um, in in a funny way, kind of home and um, ideas and the language of home was really, really um, central to the kind of um, to the to the kind of cause of why she went over. So, um, you know, we we have to go back to the kind of the autumn of 1854 uh, when um, 
there's um, in every sense a, a kind of a crisis at the heart of the British establishment. Um, they've, they've gone to war um, with very little preparation. Um, the soldiers are, um, are very ill-prepared, they don't have proper clothing, um, the, uh, the, the hospitals are, are not set up properly, um, and uh, you know, they, they, there's, a, there's a need for, for someone to kind of, um, to, to, to really kind of bring, bring a sense of kind of organisation um, to, 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 to what's happening over there. And that's really the, the reason why Nightingale is chosen. She, she, she fits a very specific breed. She kind of combines um, you know, that experience that you mentioned, Richard, of um, Harley Street. She has a kind of limited reputation for being a kind of quite a practical, hands-on person um, who, who would actually um, be able to kind of um, you know change things on the ground but then she, she also has this and this becomes really important in the kind of early press coverage that we studied um, she does have this still this kind of quite um, uh, I, this kind of association of the kind of the aristocratic kind of um, lady who's, who's kind of the way she's described is very much in terms of this kind of symbol of the English home who go over and travel um, to the other side to this unfamiliar place and bring bring a sense of um, of kind of warm familiar homeliness to the um, to the soldiers um, and so so that that was that was something kind of quite interesting to look at how that then developed um, throughout the war and you know how the newspapers particularly the times um, played a hand in kind of really nurturing that idea and and then how the kind of the the British public in general really soon start to buy into that idea and they start to um, they start to kind of engage with the war from their homes so they uh, send knitted socks over to the soldiers they send them to Nightingale who um, who will redistribute them they they knit quilts uh, they knit warm hats um, these kind of um, you know they they sacrifice sheets from their beds which can be used as bandages to wrap the wounds of the uh, of the soldiers. Um, so there's this sense of um, people kind of connecting um, with with the soldiers in the Crimean War um, from all around the UK, from all around um, different homes, different places, and kind of finding um, comfortable um, ways of kind of um, of, 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 of kind of uh, send, sending that support um, to, to the other side of Europe. So um, that, that was quite a kind of interesting aspect to, um, to, to look at. Um, but cer certainly, um, I know Richard, we spent quite a lot of time for this book um, in, the, in the archive. So that's probably um, something that's, that's quite kind of, um, we, we, we're, we're quite pleased with, with, with the book to be able to draw on um, some really kind of original research um, in terms of looking at original materials. Um, so, so that that that's something that kind of led into the book as well. And um, we 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 ended up spending quite a lot of time, didn't we, down in Buckinghamshire, at a particular. Yeah, Clayton, I think it's important to mention that because what I think what's really one of the key thing new things about this book is that there's a lot of new research in it. So there's the research we did at Clayton, which Jonathan just said, which was um, Florence Nightingale's sister's house when she got married. Uh, to a guy called Harry Verney. She ended up living in Buckinghamshire and took the family archive with her and we were able to spend quite a lot of time in, in that archive. Uh, and also there's then um, Professor Lynn MacDonald has published a 16 volume collected works of Florence Nightingale, um, which have come out in the last sort of uh, decade or so. And so that's been really, really helpful to and our, our book on, is the first book on Nightingale to really use the, all, all of those um, volumes as well. So I think there's, there's a lot of new stuff in it. Um, and um, and yeah, I think that, that that gives us maybe a bit of a new take uh, on her, and it sort of updates the picture a little bit from from previous books, I guess. Thank um, you. I think we're I think time's up, but um, it was it's been a really enjoyable journey for us all, hasn't it? And I think um, one of the things that we've got from this is coming together from slightly disciplinary perspectives and sharing ideas, and it's been so rewarding. Um, really, writing as a team. In a, in a sense, people are always quite cautious about um, joint authorship because I think authors often quite um, traditionally want to just own a manuscript and it requires a certain amount of generosity, doesn't it, to just let it go and have others critique it. 
Um, how did you two find that experience? Just quickly, just uh, 30 seconds each before. I, mean, I found it really beneficial. I think I learned an enormous, enormous amount because, as you say, you send your, your draft to someone from a different discipline. So if I send mine to Jonathan from, from an English literature background and he will have a different perspective on it and will have read different things to me. And so we'll be able to, um, to, to give me a different perspective that I can then beef up what I'm doing. And so I found that really, really helpful. What about yeah. writing in one voice? Did you find that hard, Jonathan? Because obviously when people are writing separate chapters, how, do you think that's a challenge? Yeah, no, I, th I, think, um, I think it was a really productive exercise. And I think, um, yeah, I think, I think, I think, you, I think we, we all went into it in a kind of a generous way where you, um, where you, where you accept that others will, um, will kind of develop and improve what you've, uh, what you've written. And um, you, you, it, it's quite it, it, it it's a really kind of um yeah it's a it's a great thing seeing other people kind of take 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 what you've written and then develop it further um and i think it's it's actually um it's it, it's quite a kind of interesting development i think that in the humanities that we're seeing probably more of these um co-authored books so um you know this this is something that we were uh we were very clear we wanted to um, to draw on the kind of latest research, but we also wanted it to be um, something that um, that anyone, you know, the kind of the anyone in the kind of general public who's interested in Nightingale will be able to to pick up and read and be entertained by. Um, and so, so we so we really wanted to um, to write something that was um, appealing and engaging, and that, as you say, Anna had one voice. So I think traditionally the the way of doing this has been to split it up into separate chapters and to have one author under each chapter, um, but we we've made a real effort here to to write something which hangs together as a whole. So, um, you know, hopefully we're, we're we're looking forward to kind of what readers make of it, and um, you know, to to kind of read this story of um, of, of kind of Nightingale um, at at home, you know, in all in all of its different um, guises, in all in all kinds of different contexts. And we're still friends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> still talking to each other.